Morning all, welcome. Come on in. We'll uh, get started in a sec. Just let the kids march on in first. <laughs> all right, let's uh, start with prayer and then we'll have a look at our memory verse. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your goodness. We thank you for uh, a church in this town and we thank you that uh, we can have a look at your word this morning again and uh, learn some more things. Lord, I pray that you would bless us. Pray you'd uh, be with Pastor. Pray that he'd be able to get here today. And uh, pray that uh, you would just have your hand on our, our meetings and uh, we would see the Holy Spirit work in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's go through our memory verse first. What are we? Second Sunday of the month. So you've got two more weeks after this one to learn it. This is a very, very well-known verse, or two verses. So it would be good if you don't already know this to memorise it. That's why we give you a month, consolidate, get it uh, in your long-term memory. It's good to do that short-term memory thing, but convert it to long-term memory. So uh, make sure you work on this one. Let's say it together twice. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Now let's say that one more time. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. All right, so uh, I've seen some more chocolate. So we've replenished. Plenty of chocolate reward for you, but uh, probably not the priority for this class. Well, maybe it is. I don't know. Learn your memory verse. Okay, fight the good fight of faith. This is our uh, series for this term and a bit of a uh, combative military sort of theme. See the Roman soldier there. Today we're going to look at uh, good doctrine and the doctrine doctrines of devils. So turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4 and we'll uh, have a look at some verses out of that in a minute. Uh, some general comments though, doctrine shapes our lives and you may not have thought about this before but um, what you think about in a, a rigid manner as in a doctrine will shape how you live and uh, it's not just churches that have doctrines, uh, military organisations have doctrines, they call them doctrines, uh, certain ways that they approach certain situations, certain tactics and uh, techniques. So doctrines shape our lives. Biblical doctrines are the truths, teachings, testimonies and precepts which God wants us to know. And if you want a real exposition of this, look at the first 40 verses of Psalm 119. Psalm 119 may be the most doctrine focused, not that it gives doctrines, but it talks about the value of doctrines. It doesn't use that word but it may be the most uh, doctrine-focused chapter of the whole Bible. It's certainly the longest, but uh, there's a real focus on precepts, statutes, law, judgments, these sort of words. Doctrines are the counsels, the commandments and judgments of the Almighty dispensed to the sons of men. Doctrines concern God's law, His statutes and His words graciously set forth for us to walk therein. Why does God give us doctrines? It is for our benefit. He doesn't need them. He knows them. It's for us to help us. They are the ways of the Lord, the way of life and the way of truth. The doctrines of the Bible show us stark reality. That's why people don't like them. People are delusional. They don't like reality, especially if it's harsh or stark. But the Bible tells us the truth. Doctrines show us pure holiness and our real position before the Creator. 
not some wafty, I hope it's like this, but this is the way it is. And that's whether you're saved or unsaved. Guess what? You still need to worry about what God is thinking about what you're doing once you're saved. As an unsaved person, you need to be worried about what God says about uh, where you stand for eternity. As a saved person, you need to be worried about what God is thinking about your life, what you're doing, how you're serving him. Getting doctrine right is of the utmost importance. All men have a system of doctrines which direct them in their interactions with God and other men. Everybody has a way of thinking. Everybody has a system of beliefs. Good doctrine help us, helps us to please God and see things from his perspective. And bad doctrine keeps us from pleasing God, even if we're genuine. We genuinely think we're doing the right thing. It will keep us from pleasing God, perverts our perspective, and this will do us harm. So a lot of churches in the 21st century have moved away from a focus on doctrine. And they did that for what they thought were good reasons, mainly to avoid conflict. Doctrine, if you have a focus on doctrine, it can cause conflict because people disagree. That's good doctrine? No, that's good doctrine. But uh, that doesn't mean we just throw out the baby with the bathwater, so to speak. We need to get doctrine right and uh, we need to be loving in the church. Now, interesting thing, the devil loves doctrine. We might even just turn to Genesis 3 for a quick minute. In Genesis 2, God set forth some doctrine. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. There's a commandment. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So there's a setting forth of sin. Do this, you've sinned, and there's consequences. That's doctrine. What does Satan say in verse 1 of chapter 3? Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And then if we jump down to verse 4, And the, the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, which was a direct contradiction of what God had said. The easiest way for Satan to destroy you Destroy any man is to convince you that bad doctrines are good doctrines or that good doctrines are bad doctrines. Good for evil, evil for good. What does God say about that? Woe unto them. That's in Isaiah. Even better, if the devil can convince a man that his place in heaven depends on him holding on to bad doctrine, then he's really ruined him because he will hold on to that despite evidence to the contrary, despite biblical verses proving that uh, actually that's bad doctrine. Uh, Satan can eternally ruin that man even if he has a genuine and searching heart. And this is a great tragedy with many religious people. They actually want to do the right thing, but they've just been deceived and uh, cornered, enslaved, trapped. First words of the serpent, which are recorded in the scriptures, involve questioning true doctrine and replacing it with false doctrine. Hath God said, there's the questioning, he shall not surely die. There's the false doctrine. All right, let's go back to um, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and uh, we'll see what the Apostle Paul had to say. Now, 1st and 2nd Timothy and also Titus are called the pastoral epistles because they were written to pastors and uh, certainly pastors should study them but there's also plenty in there for us that uh, we can just sort of pick up as we, as we read along but also 
uh, helps us to understand the role of pastor a bit better as well. So keep an eye out for that as we go through. All right, verse 1, James, can you read that please? In chapter 4. Uh, chapter 4. Doctrines of devils. The Apostle Paul was given great revelations through the Holy Spirit. And of all the apostles, he, I think, was given the most. And uh, we see more of his writing. I wouldn't say epistles. I think John has the same number, if you count the epistles sent to the churches in Revelation. But uh, there's certainly more of the Apostle Paul's material uh, as far as doctrinal epistles in the New Testament. He shared these doctrines with the churches through his preaching, his teaching, and of course writing those letters. And one thing which the Holy Spirit emphasised to Paul was that there would be those who would depart from the faith. The Holy Spirit might have been a shock to Paul. How could people depart from these great truths? He'd gone the other way, hadn't he? He'd been a great denier and blasphemer and persecutor and he ended up being the great Apostle Paul. But there would be some who would go the other way. I'm not saying they lost their salvation, but they would depart from the faith. This would occur in the latter times. Need to define terms. Is this the last days? Latter times, last days, same thing. There is a crossover, but there is a definition in the scriptures. Uh, the former times, the times of Gentile ignorance, defined in Acts chapter 17, verse 30. So basically before Christ and after Christ. Okay, that's one major division in history and in the Bible. And so the time of Gentile ignorance that Paul spoke to the Athenians about. And then uh, after that is called the latter times. So the whole church age is the latter time. So right throughout the church age, there's been people who have been saved and then moved away. I'm not saying they lost their salvation, but they shipwrecked themselves as far as any sort of service to God. This apostasy will peak in the last days. Now that's us. The last days of the church age is when the apostasy peaks. Let's just go over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We will get to this perhaps next year, but let's have a look at these verses now anyway. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. All right, so doctrinally perilous times will arrive in the last days, and they have. And chapter 4, verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. We've arrived. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers. I hate this verse. I'm a teacher, and <laughs> it's very negative on teachers. So, but not maths teachers. <laughs> We're running out of maths teachers. Anyone want to be a maths teacher? There's plenty of jobs. <laughs> uh, heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. So, so that's the last days. So the latter times, that's the whole church age, latter in comparison to former, before Christ, then after Christ is the latter times, then the last days of the latter times, that's now, right at the end of the church age. The main issue will be a departure from sound doctrine. We saw that in uh, 2 Timothy there. Now, it's been seducing spirits which have caused the great apostasies of the church age. And we know that the false religions are affected by demonic forces and unclean spirits and familiar spirits and all that sort of thing. We look at the, uh, the start of Islam, the start of Mormonism, both have apparently Gabriel turning up and talking to Muhammad or Joseph Smith and giving a, an extra revelation. So that's obviously demonic. Uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, if you've ever been anywhere near any of that, you'll spot the, the demon activity pretty quickly. Communism, they profess to be atheists, but they're not actually. They're quite, uh, there's a, unclean spirits all over anything communist. Even evolutionary science 
It's interesting, uh, we all know Darwin, we all know about Darwin. There was another guy at the same time came up with exactly the same theory. And Darwin actually didn't publish his paper straight away. He sat on it for a while, didn't put it forward. And this other guy, Alfred Russell Wallace, who was, don't like that connection either. <laughs> uh, he was in Indonesia. He was, in, uh, he was a naturalist studying in Indonesia. And he came up with this theory, which was identical to Darwin's. And he actually wrote it up and sent it off to Darwin and said, what do you think? And Darwin looked at it and said, I think it looks a lot like what I'm working on. And that prompted him to publish his book, The Theory, well, Origin of Species, I think, Theory of Evolution. Um, interesting thing about Alfred Russell Wallace was he was into the occult. Big time. He used to lecture on it. So there's a strong connection between the theory of evolution or evolutionary science and unclean spirits. Well, as bad as all that is, the greatest damage has been caused within the churches. And we have a great religious, apparently Christian harlot, the Mystery Babylon, the Roman Catholic Church of Revelation 17, verses 1 to 9. And that has dragged away millions of souls in every generation. See, the greatest damage is done by those that pretend to be Christian. A proportion of these people may have believed the gospel if they were not enslaved by the doctrines of Rome. We've got to remember that. Why did Satan set up this fake church? It's to stop people getting saved. A lot of Catholics would have got saved if they hadn't already been locked into this other system. Very hard to get them out too. Try witnessing to a Catholic. You can show them the Bible, you can show them verses, they will agree that that is what the Bible says. And when you try to apply it to them, they will say, oh no, I can't do that. My church says this. So this has been a turning away, a seducing of people by unclean spirits. The priests threaten them with eternal damnation if they listen to a Bible preaching Christian. Now, it's not just the Catholics. There's a bit of uh, material on the Catholics in this lesson, but it's not just the Catholics. Theologians, Bible scholars, church authorities from all groups, Protestants and others, uh, have had this problem over the centuries. The, the devils have whispered in their ears about certain things, promoted certain doctrines, and caused just an absolute mess. Doctrines of devils abound. Now... We're independent Baptists. And we have been less troubled by this, not because we're superior people. We're just as susceptible as anybody else in and of ourselves. The approach of the independent Baptists has tended to be more biblical. And that's been a bit of a, uh, a protection for us. But don't get too uh, slack. Don't less, uh, rest on your laurels. We are not immune. False doctrine can still get into our churches, so we must remain on guard. Um, it's interesting, the more biblical a church or an organisation is, the less it gets dragged off into false doctrine. But uh, we still need to be careful. All right, uh, verse 2. Satan lies in Uh, yeah, we'll go through to verse 7, please. Sure. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Well, it speaks out of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Okay, well, if you look at uh, verses 2 and 3, you might recognise some things. What do we see there? Sorry, 
3 and 4. Forbidding to marry. Which church group forbid, uh, forbids at least certain people to marry? Catholic Church. Yeah. Priests are not allowed to marry. And anybody that holds an official office in that church. I think that's correct. I think they're trying to change it. Ah, I think the Pope came out the other day and said, no. Nope. <laughs> anyway. Let them worry about what they worry about. Commanding to abstain from meats. Only fish on Friday. Can't eat this or that during Lent. I don't even know what those rules are. And it's funny. You see Protestants follow them as well. I've had a number of times someone said to me when I've been eating meat on a Friday, what? You're a Christian. You can't eat meat on Friday. Why not? Gets into everywhere, doesn't it? Now, it should be noted that many Catholics in Australia are decent people who try to do good. They're often very good people. Honest. Some of them aren't. But uh, often they are. I see them as victims of their church, which is not really a church, which oppresses them. They're victims. So these criticisms are directed at the organisation which treats its own people so badly. And they're so loyal. They're so loyal to this organisation which just treats them so badly. Like the Pharisees of old, the Catholic priests speak lies in hypocrisy. You see that in verse 2. And they've done it for so long, their consciences are now dulled to the pointed jabs of the Holy Spirit. See it. So when, uh, if you get a burn, you get a bad burn, all the nerves get destroyed and you just have a part on your skin that doesn't, can't feel anything. You poke it with a needle and you don't feel it. So when the Holy Spirit takes the needle of conscience and jabs them, they're so dulled to all this, they don't even feel it. They forbid their clergy to marry and they forbid meat at certain times. <coughs> Only fish on Friday, as I said. But God's created marriage and set it forth as the normal condition. You don't have to get married, but it's normal. Most people do. God's created animals and given them to man for meat. When Noah came off the ark, one of the things God said was, okay, you're not a vegetarian anymore. Now you're going to eat meat. I've given you all the animals to eat. Now there was a restriction when God gave the law of Moses. They weren't to eat certain animals, but that was only under the Jewish law. Some animals are clean and unclean. I always laugh at the Muslims. They, uh, they won't eat pig because that's unclean. They got that from the law of Moses. But they'll eat camel. That was also unclean under the law of Moses. Maybe they didn't read it very carefully. I don't know. Uh, now, look, you don't have to eat everything. Beef, lamb, chicken turkey, there might be one other. That's about it. I'm not that interested. A little bit of fish maybe, some prawns. Not that interested in much else. But you go overseas and some places they eat everything. I noticed this in Vietnam, Cambodia. The reason is there's very little protein in their diet. They have to eat these things. So you see the, the street vendors with the fried uh, grasshoppers dipped in honey so Westerners can eat it, I think. And uh, oh, should I try it? My daughter Rebecca, she tried everything, <laughs> loved it. It was like a, a sport for her. But um, you don't have to eat everything. You don't have to eat all the things that are on offer, but you can. None of it's evil to eat. You need whatever you want. <coughs> God has given it to you. Now what about this unclean business? Well, it says in verse 4, Every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. So, and uh, verse 5, Sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So you give thanks, you pray over the food, it's sanctified. It's not unclean anymore. Apostle Peter learned that lesson, didn't he? The Lord brought those animals down in a sheet out of heaven and that was all unclean animals. And God said, come on, Peter, it's lunchtime. Peter said, I can't eat those. 
God said, well, what I've made clean, don't you call unclean? Now, that was also a, an interpretation for us. The Gentiles were no longer unclean, but the food thing is right there, isn't it? And it tells us here that uh, if we pray over it, it's clean. Eat whatever you want, as long as your doctor allows it. Uh, just pray over it first. All right, verse 8. Who did we get up to around there? We'll go through to verse 13, please. Sarah, do you want to read verse 9? This is a faithful saying and worthy of all expectation. For therefore we both labour and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Saviour of all men, especially of those that believe. This thing is from our heritage. Let your mind be straight by you that you go an example of believers in word and in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Okay, so this is talking about the example of a godly pastor. We need to pay attention. You go, well, I'm never going to be a pastor. Yeah, but, you know, the church is run by a pastor and uh, you need to know what it's all about. Otherwise, when you're making decisions or if you're uh, responding to something a pastor has said, you might not get it right. So we need to know about this. Instead of peddling hypocritical lies, the true minister of Christ nourishes his people with the words of faith and good doctrine. So that's the comparison, the hypocritical priest who has no conscience anymore because he's been doing the wrong thing for so long and a, a pastor who's into the word, who has the Holy Spirit's power teaching the words of faith and good doctrine. This pastor refuses to get into profane fables, the myths, the legends, the profanities, the conspiracy theories. Be careful with those. You know, some conspiracy theories are true. It's just a matter of probability, isn't it? You have a thousand conspiracy theories, a couple of them have to be true, but most of them aren't. So we shouldn't get tangled up too much in any of that. Look, what did David say? The things that are higher than me, you know, things of government and things like that, I'm not going to get too involved in that. Just do what I'm supposed to do at my level and let the Lord take care of that. And be careful of the group think of worldly people. Uh, the godly pastor refuses to endorse old wives' fables, rosary beads, Friday the 13th, good and bad luck, you know, black cats, mirrors, ladders, as they also say, horseshoes, umbrellas, knocking on wood, salt, all that stuff. It's just rubbish. It's old wives' fables. Now, if he's not going to get involved in that, neither should we. Oh, yes, the little drummer boy. Where did he come from? I did not see him in Matthew or Luke. He wasn't there. So I don't know why people think that's a Christmas song. What's it got to do with Christmas? The good pastor exercises himself in Bible doctrine and godly living. Pay attention. If your pastor's godly, if your pastor's interested in doctrine, you should do that too. You should be following his example. These are things of eternal value. Now, what about bodily exercise? I have been around groups and in churches that are really down on sport and stuff like that. I don't think that's wise. At least certain young men and probably young women too need to run around, kick a ball, throw a ball, do whatever. It's just part of who they are. They need to do that. I was one of them. Still am in some ways. You've got to be careful. You can easily go too far with that sort of thing and end up in places you shouldn't be. A lot of alcohol involved in Australian sport. So that is one thing that really you need to be careful with. But we shouldn't just say to these young men, Let, you're Christians now, that's it, no more sport. I think that is quite foolish. There is some value to bodily exercise. You know, the guys that want to be in the gym, I don't know why you'd want to be in a the gym, they stink, but anyway. 
Some people go there, that's, that they like it. And, and they need to get some energy out. You see people running. Most of us just drive, but they go for a run, you know, 10K run. I ran 10Ks yesterday. Sounds like a lot of effort. <laughs> they need to do it. Bodily exercise has some value for the present. Shouldn't become dominant in a Christian's life as its value is short-lived. And that's the problem. There's nothing wrong with the exercise in and of itself. It's good. You should do some exercise. You should keep your body somewhat healthy. Okay, some more than others, but it's a good thing. But the value is short-lived. It's only for this life. It has no eternal value. Godliness has value in this life. It will help you in this life and also has eternal value. So it's superior. Exercising yourself in godliness is superior to exercising your body. Not to say that bodily exercise is bad. You need to do it. Some people need to do more than others because that's just the way that they're built. They just have to get out there and kick a ball or run 10Ks or whatever it is they need to do. But uh, it's short-lived value. Now, a mature pastor will also know that people will not always understand why he says what he says and why he does what he does. Sometimes you might look at pastor and go, why is he doing that? I don't get it. Sometimes people look at what pastors say or do and they get angry and start attacking the pastor because they don't like it. Well, this can happen. Sometimes there are attacks from within. Thankfully, we haven't had too much of that in our church. And you're definitely going to get attacks from without. The unsaved out there will attack Christians, the pastor, the church from time to time. We have had a little bit of that too. This is quite natural and to be expected. Labouring and suffering for the sake of Christ are normal parts of the Christian life. If you're not suffering in some way for being a Christian, even if it's not great, if you're not suffering in some way, if there's not something negative being done towards you because you're a Christian, uh, then perhaps you're not testifying enough. Perhaps people don't know that you're a Christian. Because if they do know, somebody is going to do something negative towards you. And we just accept that because we trust in the living God. Verse 10 is another one of those uh, great verses which destroys multiple heresies. A lot of heresy destruction in 1 Timothy. Paul went after the heretics in 1 Timothy. Verse 10 states that the living God is the saviour of all men. Think about that. The living God is the saviour. Well, who's the saviour? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the living God. Well, there goes the JWs and Mormons. One heresy down. Secondly, Christ is the saviour of who? All men. Now, the Calvinists at this point will jam in the elect. They interpret all men as being the elect. But that's not what it says. It says all men. It would seem obvious that it's everyone, unsaved as well as saved. So the Calvinists sort of try to wrestle this around and teach exactly what the verse does not say. But this verse has a bit more, doesn't it? Ah, a little zing in the tail there. It says, especially of those that believe. So Christ is the saviour of all men and especially the saviour of those that believe. We understand that. He can be the saviour of the unsaved, but not much use to them, is it, if they never get saved? He's the saviour, but if you never get saved, what good was that for you? It's not his fault, it's your fault, but it didn't do you any good. But if you get saved, then he's especially the saviour, isn't he? It changed your eternal destiny. So that leaves us with two groups of people that he is the saviour of, believers and unbelievers. Well, the limited atonement where God picks certain people and Christ only died for them, it's gone. At that point, it is unsustainable. It collapses under the contradictions that it has with God's word. All right, let's finish this off. Uh, I think we're back to you, James, verse 11.
Interesting chapter this. It's got both the Catholics and the Presbyterians in it. All right, see that there? The word presbytery in verse 14. All right, Timothy was to command. Ooh. Australians don't like that, do they? Australians don't like being told what to do. A wise pastor will know these things and uh, perhaps act accordingly. But uh, the fact of the matter is, a pastor should be telling us, this is what God says, you need to do this. And a pastor needs to be able to tell us these things and know that we're going to do them. So just because we have an issue with pastoral authority doesn't mean we're right. Now there is another side to this, if the pastor's wrong, that's a bit of a problem, but uh, just be very sure he's wrong before you decide you're not going to do as he says you should do. It's up to him to command and teach the words of faith and good doctrine. Now Timothy was quite young, well we don't know exactly what his age was, but there is reference there to his youth. Uh, but he had the authority of the Apostle Paul behind him and Paul knew he'd do a good job and he pushed Timothy to get on with it. And it was only fear and hesitation that was going to defeat Timothy. Paul knew he had the, uh, everything else he needed. He was to be an example in what he said, what he did, how he gave, in his attitude and spirit, in the faith he displayed during tough situations. That's when you're going to know what sort of value your pastor is. When things are tough, is he able to handle that and respond appropriately? And in the comprehensive purity of his life, he was to read the Bible a lot. Till I come, give attendance to reading. Exhort the believers to shape up in the Christian life. That's the exhortation. Come on. It's like a... Sporting coach, come on, do it. Do it right. Let's get it. Let's get this right. And to teach a lot of doctrine. As a companion of the Apostle Paul, Timothy had a special gift of ministry. We don't know exactly what that was. It was just a special gift to be in the ministry and to be good at it. He seemed to be really good at it. When uh, Paul and Silas got chased out of Thessalonica, Timothy stayed and actually consolidated the church and he did such a good job that Paul says in Thessalonians first epistle that uh, I was worried about you guys but you turned out great he said we weren't there long enough we got chased out of town you guys turned out great we're shocked <laughs> Timothy stayed maybe that was that gift and this gift had been bestowed by the laying on of hands by the pastors of his home church. Now, this is during the apostolic age. Uh, there was prophecy involved. So we expect all that. But um, we do things a little differently now. Timothy was a special case because he was under the Apostle Paul. But we can see some things here that uh, we can apply as well. We have pastors who are given... Gifts by the Lord, and they had to do these things to preach and to teach and exhort and to encourage. Timothy was a little bit fragile. We see that in, um, I think, in the second epistle. Paul says, I'm mindful of your tears. It's all been a bit much for you at times. But he was to think back and remember all of these things that had happened in the past and uh, the way he'd been prepared for this role. He was to study the scriptures and meditate on what he would teach and preach. And it's this careful, contemplative approach 
soaked in good doctrine that would save both Timothy and his congregation from what? Let's say, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. What are they being saved from? Hell? Well, if they're unsaved, I guess, and they get saved, yes. What, if, what about if they're already saved? Timothy was already saved. What would he be saved from? Being deceived. Remember the start of the chapter? The seducing spirits, the doctrines of devils. Be saved from going down the wrong path, believing the wrong thing. All right, we'll leave it there and we'll go and have a cup in a minute. Let's just close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you set forth these things. We thank you that we have these warnings. We know that there's uh, unclean spirits that would drag aside believers into believing the wrong thing. And Lord, I pray we would take doctrine seriously, study out uh, what your word says. Pray you bless us now. I pray for our uh, time together in the main service. In Jesus' name, amen.